Am I just going to use the uh, podium? Podium mics, okay. Uh, thank you, Fred. So uh, I think since I'm the first uh, speaker and this is a policy meeting, I'm going to try to stay at very high altitude. Uh, and also, uh, because I only have five to ten minutes, I'm going to uh, take some liberties here and oversimplify some issues I actually know are far more nuanced, but uh, give me a pass on this. Uh, so one example is this. So I'm going to artificially sort of dichotomize science and engineering. And so at the risk of oversimplifying, I think of science as learning the rules and engineering as applying the rules or using the rules. Uh, science is often dominated by uh, individuals, whereas uh, engineering is often uh, done by coordinated teams. Perhaps for that reason, engineering often uh, demands top-down management, whereas sometimes with uh, science, you're better off having sort of a bottom-up sort of approach. Uh, importantly, uh, in science, especially early-stage science, as we all know, timelines and deliverables are unpredictable, and you're fundamentally limited by knowledge, whereas in engineering, uh, often the timelines and the deliverables are predictable, and you're simply limited by uh, resources. Uh, now, I learned at an earlier uh, IOM uh, committee uh, about 10 years ago uh, that science, especially early science, is often dominated by what are called the lone hunter-gatherer scientists who sort of follow their noses and their curiosity, and you hope that some of them make uh, discoveries. So you send them off in different directions and hope that somebody comes back with something uh, that's useful. Uh, this is in stark contrast to engineering, where frequently you want everybody in lockstep going off in the same uh, direction. And I often think of the quote that uh, we've all heard from Albert Einstein, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research when it comes to uh, basic science. But uh, as simple as this cartoon is, I think it's important because I think we all can appreciate that the people who do this well aren't necessarily the people who do this well and vice versa. So if you have policies that, for example, are coercing these people to become these people, I would argue it's uh, incredibly uh, short-sighted and uh, counterproductive. Uh, so why talk about the difference between science and engineering? Well, of course, uh, in most of our lifetimes, arguably the greatest uh, engineering feat was putting a man on the moon. And Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon in 10 years. And he was right, plus or minus six months. But fortunately for Kennedy, you know, Galileo and Newton had already come and gone. So most of the science you needed was known. And it was simply had been reduced to a magnificent engineering task, but an engineering task nonetheless. But if you don't understand the distinction between science and engineering, and you try to make believe that cancer is fundamentally an engineering problem, you say things that sound, in hindsight, either a bit naive or a bit disingenuous. So uh, Fred and I cringed the first time we heard this. I still cringe every time I see it. Uh, how are we doing here? Well, I think uh, we, we're not going to make it, unfortunately. I wish we could say we're going to make it. Uh, but you know, this is trying to make cancer fit into a box of this is an engineering problem. Now, uh, in fairness, lots of people do this. So some of you probably read this article that applauded that finally we've gotten our acts together. We're all holding hands. We're all working in teams. And they applauded uh, two initiatives, uh, one of which is talking about cancer deliverables in five years. Another is talking about cancer deliverables in three years. Again, I think this does a great disservice to those lone hunter-gatherer scientists who are trying to be the front end of the discovery engine for cancer. And I think all of us who understand the complexity of this disease understand that this is still a mixture of science and engineering. And so for example, I would argue that we're in this transitional point where we need both activities. Uh, so I, th I think we still have a role for uh, individuals who want to follow their curiosity and, for example, study their favorite gene, protein, organelle, da 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 uh, I think this is still science. I think there are a lot of rules that we have to still learn in cancer. But fortunately, I think there are some activities in our community that are now ha having more the feeling of engineering, where you can start to say, you know, if I had these resources, I could accomplish the following things with the following sort of uh, timelines. So for example, I would put under this heading uh, cancer genome sequencing, uh, high throughput sRNA screens, building appropriate databases, et cetera, et cetera. Those start to have some feelings of, of engineering uh, to me. So we all want to translate. We all want to apply cancer knowledge to the benefit of patients. But uh, I, I, again, I'm probably preaching to the choir. I would argue every great translational story has the same features. And that is, there was a line of investigation that matured to a point where you actually knew enough to do something, where sort of the light bulb went off, and this led to uh, something that actually had an impact on patients. So if you look, for example, at the poster, one of the current poster uh, children for translation, it's certainly Gleevec, which of course began with work about 20 years ago with the identification of the Philadelphia chromosome, the cloning of the BCR able fusion, the demonstration that able was a kinase, uh, work in preclinical models that this was actually a causal event in the pathogenesis of CML. 
Uh, and finally, we learned from Alex Levitsky and others uh, that kinases could be inhibited with small molecules that had pharmacological properties. And of course, this led to Levec. So I would, again, at the risk of oversimplifying, say that you know this early stage work feels more to me like science. And then you sort of reach a transitional point where it starts to feel a little bit more like engineering. Uh, perhaps for that reason, historically, uh, this has been uh, the domain of academic scientists. Uh, and when you hit that light bulb moment, you start to take over, uh, you, or you start to have a handoff, if you will, to biotech and pharma. And you know, I think it's been pointed out uh, by a number of people, and I think it's true, uh, the, the, the biotech and pharmaceutical industry is the best translational machine I think that's ever been built. They're just waiting to be fed uh, by those of us in academia. And they're actually quite uh, good at doing engineering. Now, another way to look at this is you could say that this is sort of disease-oriented applied research out here. Uh, maybe this we'll call disease-oriented uh, basic research. Uh, but in fairness, uh, this was made possible by something else, which is very early stage, unfettered, curiosity-driven basic science. And so I'll call this not disease-oriented basic research. Now, uh, the reason I show this is because I've spoken with a number of people in pharma and biotech who say, you know, it's terrific that some of you in academia are now trying to do uh, drug discovery and things that might have previously been uh, the purview of biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies. So if you want to spend more time over on the right side of the graph, that's great. But please, whatever you do, don't stop doing this. Because we can't do this. We can't afford to do this. Our investors won't allow us to do this, be precisely because the timelines and the, uh, and the deliverables are unpredictable. So I would argue the secret sauce over the past 50 or 60 years was to let the public sector worry about this very vulnerable part of the research enterprise. Uh, and to let the uh, private sector take over as things mature to a point where you actually had enough knowledge to actually do something uh, useful with the information. And so I think for late stage research, I think it's very clear that uh, biotech and pharma, as well as philanthropic organizations and various foundations can help pick up part of the load. But I don't see anybody else other than the federal government and uh, the public sector defending and supporting uh, this type of uh, research. Now, uh, there are many examples of why we need unfettered, curiosity-driven research. This happens to be my one this month. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with these two papers, uh, these two laboratories were studying how bacteria defend themselves against uh, other uh, organisms and stumbled upon this beautifully elegant system that they use to modify the DNA of, invading, of invaders. But very quickly, uh, the investigators shown here have shown that this very same methodology can be used to do gene editing in mammalian cells. And so this is already revolutionizing uh, cancer research. Uh, I can tell you it's extremely effective. You can go in and modify very specifically genes within a mammalian cancer cell. And there are some people already entertaining that eventually this will be a, 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 an approach that could be used uh, for uh, modifying genes in humans. <clears throat> so here are my th uh, three questions. I've spent most of the morning talking about the need to protect and nurture basic discovery. Uh, in the public sector, so it's to complement applied research in the private uh, sector. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about, however, is the fact that most of us know to be a successful uh, basic cancer researcher today, uh, you have to train multiple replicas of yourself. Uh, and so these uh, arguably underpaid and overworked trainees, including postdocs, have been likened to indentured servants. Uh, and of course, they're willing to be indentured servants because they think when they finish, uh, they're going to have very productive and well-supported careers, including, for example, having the right to be an R01-funded investigator. Uh, but of course, this leads to geometric growth in the number of people who think they should be doing biomedical uh, research. And so this comes to a head about every uh, 10 or 15 years. And so unless we're going to continue to double the budget every 10 or 15 years, which frankly would be a fine solution by me. Uh, but I suspect <coughs> we'll have to come up with some more thoughtful approaches to how do you deal with the fact that we've built a system in which successful investigators are not training one or two replicas of themselves, but in some cases are training 30, 40, or 100 replicas of themselves. So again, unless we continue to, to double the budget or we continue to have uh, never-ending expansion of the biotech and pharmaceutical industry, uh, this is going to be uh, a problem. Uh, finally, I felt for uh, a number of years, and I still feel it's the case, uh, we could do better in terms of how we exchange information and reagents, not only amongst ourselves in the public sector, but also with our colleagues. Uh, in the private sector. And so, for example, I still uh, grimace when I understand or learn that there are drugs well into human clinical trials where no investigator in the public sector has had an opportunity to study 
uh, those drugs to see whether they might have additional applications or, or frankly, uh, hidden liabilities that might uh, uh, eventually emerge through further uh, clinical testing. So I hope we can come up with more creative ways to exchange information uh, and reagents between uh, the private sector and public sector. So with that, those are my comments. Um, what we're going to do this is that overall we have uh, about uh, 15 minutes time for each speaker. Uh, and each speaker, if they take to 10 minutes, we can have one or two questions right now and then open it up for a broader discussion. This questions now, I would hope, would be more factual and, and pointed rather than broadly open. So are there some specific questions uh, that you'd like to address to, to Bill, if there are any in the audience? So I would like to ask you uh, your thoughts, maybe just to expand for a second or two about, uh, first of all, thank you for yeah. really elegant and thoughtful comments, but particularly the second point of we do have these trainees, these postdocs. Um, <laughs> what would be some thoughts about a sustainable model for that outside of the doubling of the, the yep. budget yes. every <laughs> 10 years? So first of all, when I've spoken to people in uh, biotech or pharma, they often point out that uh, they have the luxury, they, they can hire people to do what they're good at and not ask them to do things they're not good at. So for example, maybe they're very good at doing science, maybe they're wonderfully technical, they're wonderful technically, but maybe they wouldn't be the best person for writing a grant or giving a talk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in pharma and biotech, uh, they, they describe that they can actually form human complementation groups of having people bring to the table what they do well. Uh, and whereas in academia, we sort of had one size fits all, as you know, that to be a successful investigator, you have to do multiple things at least reasonably uh, well. So I, 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 I think if we could be a little more creative about having perhaps non-tenure track uh, scientists who would be paid, not as a postdoc, but maybe not as a <laughs> tenure professor, but to do what they're good at. Uh, and I think we have to evolve towards a system where they're not seen as second-class citizens. Because I think that's usually the pushback within most academic institutions, as you know, uh, that these people sometimes feel like they're second-class uh, citizens. But I'm starting to see them emerge, and I think it's got to be part of the <coughs> solution to have people, you know, I think supported as non-tenure-tracked uh, scientists, but to do work in an academic environment. Great. Thoughtful. Yeah, Andrea. Yeah, I think you've addressed beautifully this sort of dichotomy of industry is really like trying to emulate that our service served by reading it out of you in a book uh, or in a, a published paper. So I think um, it would be really great to have your thoughts on how we can improve that. Well, I can tell you the very, very first thing at the top of the list, uh, again, speaking on behalf of my colleagues in pharma and biotech, you know, I think they would say it's the uh, the, the robustness of the uh, of the information we're providing to them uh, that says, you know, this is a go, this is a target, this is a d device strategy, this is a biomarker, whatever. You know, I, I think, as you probably know, there have been a number of high-profile papers written recently in terms of how often our colleagues in pharma and biotech can't replicate the findings that we are publishing with respect to targets, devices, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think uh, that's a whole other uh, discussion why that has come to be. Uh, but I think we have to set the bar higher ourselves in terms of making sure this is not uh, they sometimes disparagingly disparaging make the comment, this is publication grade, but it's not pharmaceutical grade, okay? Meaning, <laughs> meaning, meaning it worked in your cell line uh, on Wednesday, and you got your cell paper, but, you know, it has to be much more robust than that if we're going to uh, have a multi-million dollar drug discovery effort built on this information. So I think we have to set the bar higher in terms of how we disseminate information and make sure that the information is robust. Great. Thank you, Bill. Okay, that was wonderful. Um, as I say, we will have uh, all of us uh, in front in just a few minutes after, towards the end of the session. Uh, the next uh, talk is going to be from Andrea uh, Califano from Columbia. I think all of us have been uh, uh, aware of Andrea's uh, fantastic work uh, in systems biology, and uh, uh, we'll be talking over the next 10 minutes. Andrea, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it.